Kathy, do you want to um, start looking at the list and letting folks in that you? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the District 1, the very first of this new year, Michelle's first and my first in the way we're gonna do it today. Um, this is the district one meeting and we apologize. We, there's a little bit of delay as we got the snafus out. I'm gonna ask um, everyone who I see as an attendee, if you would like to be brought in to be part of uh, the panel, you know, so in other words, you would get to see each other. And if you would like to, um, if you can raise your hand, uh, Michelle and I will bring you in rather than having you out in the public. Um, and I'm going to bring in everyone that I see that I know. <laughs> and what I'm seeing right now is of the hands that have gone up, I know everybody. Um, so we're basically gonna bring in everyone unless you don't wanna be brought in. And this will enable you, um, we have a, as you saw the posted agenda, we're hoping that we have plenty of time for discussion, for ideas from you. And I see two people did not raise their hand. Um, if you don't want to, and you wanna participate, oh, yeah. now I see another hand up. And uh, one more person who I know, and she hasn't raised her hand, so I'll let her decide. But Michelle, do you want to go ahead and start bringing people in? Yeah, just to clarify, do we promote them to panelists or allow to yeah. talk? If you promote them to panelists, they will be here um, where we can see each other. Um, okay. And it's not just a temporary allow to talk. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. we're, we're going to do that. So right now there are 10 people. And so Michelle is bringing you each in. Um, and, you know, the protection the town is set up, just I'll explain on this, the way they've done the Zoom webinars is to stop for stop the chance of Zoom bombing. So both Michelle and I have a Zoom account and we're considering whether we'll just run it on ours and then we might have people register in advance just so we know when we're bringing people in but um, we're going to bring everyone in who said they wanted to be brought in, which as far as I can see is everyone. Um, and I'll just wait a few minutes till people come in. And I know um, just in past district one meetings when we've done them on Zoom, there's been a request that we do this, but so people know who else is there. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is we have some initial remarks we wanna make um, a, and I'll show the agenda up on the screen. And then um, after some initial remarks, we wanna turn it into a broader discussion. So when I, um, yeah, I'm just, everyone's coming in. So I, I'll keep chit-chatting along, Michelle, and as we- Maybe just announce again for some new folks that just joined to raise their hand if they would in fact like to be brought in. Okay, so we're, we're trying to do this in a new way on Zoom. If you would like to be brought in so you can see each other, know who you're here, just raise your hand and, and Michelle is promoting you. And that will, uh, I request that you keep your mics on mute and then do the hand raise when you wanna talk, um, but this will enable everyone. So I'm seeing there are three more people, one just joined, one, one clearly would rather be in the audience, which is fine. You do not have to come in if you, um, okay, uh, Claude is raising his hand. So if, if you would rather stay out in the public, you can raise a hand at any time and we will allow you to talk and participate. So you won't be excluded. Um, okay, let's see, Claude is, uh, what's happening here? Okay, that should have worked. So we still have four folks in the attendees. Um, if you any if 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 you would like to be brought into the room, uh, please raise your hand, as Kathy said, and we will gladly bring you in. And, and you don't you don't have to do it right now either. Okay, Lisa is raising her hand. Um, you know you don't have to do it right now. If later on you want to talk, um, just raise your hand. This just. This was a request, so we're going to try it out and we have a manageable number of people. So while I'm um, chit-chatting away, I'm gonna try to share my screen just to remind you um, what we're doing today. Um, uh, 
uh, from the beginning. So I'm hoping everyone can see see my screen. Um, this is this is the agenda that we posted um, for the meeting, and um, as you're hearing, I'm Kathy Shane. For anyone who I haven't met, and Michelle Miller is my co-counselor. Delight delighted to have her at her first, first district one meeting as a counselor, and we I put up on the screen the committees that we're currently on, and we're not gonna say much about the committee work specifically today. And I can share this list later for any of you who are interested in it. But throughout the year, because we're on these committees, we'll be able to alert you to upcoming events that are coming on, or um, to the extent you wanna request a presentation, we will. So that's just, I'm just gonna leave that list up there. I'm on the elementary school building committee. I'm the chair of that. I'm on finance and I'm on joint capital planning committee. Michelle's on finance with me. And I see that Andy Steinberg, who's chair of finance has joined us. He's from, he's our at-large counselor. And she's on governance, organization and legislation, which basically reviews our bylaw, makes sure we're doing things well, does proclamations and she is, Michelle, are you still chair or co-chair of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly? Yes, yes, I am chair of GOL and the African Heritage Reparation Assembly. So the, the agenda is as you see it here, and I'm gonna take the screen back down. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is some upcoming events and dates and try to be pretty efficient on this with me um, coming second and talking about the elementary school building committee, what it is and where we're going. Um, then the two of us will do a really short report on some work we've started doing at the request of some residents in District 1, um, talking about um, off-campus student housing and some issues related to that. Then we're moving to a totally open discussion um, where we hope that you will suggest ideas uh, for future agendas, uh, bring up any issues now, um, and finally, um, whether how often you'd like to have these meetings. Um, so that that is what we're going to do today. And we promise that we will end sharply at five. Up on the screen, and it was in the Zoom invites as well, are our emails, our town emails, and our phone numbers. And both of us are totally willing and encourage you to contact us, um, even if it's small or large, uh, including agenda items, but we, we would like to be accessible. So Michelle, before I take the stand, do you wanna say anything about my brief, this is what we're doing today? No, just welcome to everyone. And thank you for coming on the Sunday afternoon. And it's nice to see you all. I'm glad we're able to bring folks in. And just one more reminder, if you're in the attendees, uh, there are some new folks who joined. If you would like to come in um, and be in the meeting, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll bring you in. Um, and I also see that Claude has a hand up. So I just wanna check to make sure there aren't any technical issues or um, Claude, would, would you like to um, say something? I think maybe his hand there's a there's a lower hand button if you look down at the bottom so if your hand was up to come into the room then you can lower it so two participants still have their hand up michelle yeah. i just moved mary in i only see mary um is there another participant with a hand up here that you see that wants to come in uh no i only see mary no one else has raised their hand. So that, um, so again, if you're if you're joining late, if you would like to be one of the faces on the screen, and you can always hide your video, we can bring you in. If you would like at any time, if you want to join the discussion, just raise your hand, and we'll promote you to be able to talk. So the one other thing about our using the town Zoom that we just discovered uh, when we talked about it this morning is we don't have a chat room. So if we, um, I think if we use our personal Zooms, we'll be able to have that. So as we go through, we may have to just give you information verbally. We won't be able to put it into a chat, but we'd be happy to, if you want us to send it back out to you later, we can. 
So I think we're leading off with you, Michelle. Sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to start with some some upcoming events and dates um, in the next four to five weeks here uh, before we'll meet again. Um, so on and and just to preface this. Um, Kathy will talk about the school building project separately after I finish with these other dates in terms of dates there. So February 1st at 6 p.m., Black History Month flag raising is happening on the front steps of the town hall and everyone is welcome to join. On February 12th, uh, we will be having a council retreat and this will be open to the public. It's a special meeting, so there will be no public comment per se. However, if you have anything you would like to share, we'll be working on our priorities during that meeting. Please do feel free to email uh, Kathy and myself and, and we'll make sure to read those. And you can also email the full council. There's a link on the town council website that you can email the full town council. And I'd like to say in terms of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, uh, we meet every other Thursday at 6.30. Of course, that's open to the public. I encourage you to come and check it out. And our meeting in right now, we're gonna be meeting next, this coming uh, Thursday, February 3rd at 6.30. So that's all I have right now for announcements and I'll hand it over to you, Kathy and Liz. Michelle, I'm thinking that you might I think most people know what the African heritage is, but you might want to say what you're what you're doing right now for to the extent they want to come to the meeting. So sure. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the African Heritage Reparation Assembly is a committee that has been set up to study and make recommendations to the town council with respect to reparations for African heritage residents in Amherst. And I am the chair of that committee. Uh, right now we're working on a phase one of a three phased process and it will mostly entail community engagement and education. So this is where we'll really hope to engage with individual residents, with some of our anchor institutions and organizations. Uh, we'll begin some education uh, throughout the community. And I really encourage you, whether you have a strong interest or no interest to please um, come to our website, take a look at our resources. Um, tentatively on March 7th, uh, I will be um, presenting at the town council meeting and um, starting that educational process for our for my fellow counselors. So I think that's it. Yep, that's great. And it, we're just going to go through these pretty quickly so we can then open it up. And I'm going to share my screen again for the, um, let me just make sure. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? All right. Um, I'm, I'm chair of the elementary school building project and you might have seen there was an article this past week, both in the Gazette and the um, and the Amherst Bulletin outlining uh, the target dates that are coming up. What we are about is talking about a new or remodeled um, renovated and expanded elementary school. There's been no decision about which site it will go on yet. This is either Wal at Wal Wildwood or Fort River. Upcoming, you can hear more about this at a community forum that's coming up on February 3rd, and these are wide open to the community. I've also put the project website where any event that's coming up is up on the website and frequently asked questions and answers are finally up. We were being asked, it's a frequently asked question. There were no questions and there were no answers, but we did manage to get questions and answers up. But I'm, I'm the chair of this and I'd be happy to hear from anyone. The third educational visioning workshop is coming up in two weeks. And what this is doing is hearing from both staff who work at the schools, teachers, and there've been several separate meetings with the teaching staff to what's the education program as it relates to the building, you know, at the building design, what do we want to see happening inside? So not everything we do with education affects 
the building, but we have to have an education program to go to the next step for the granting authority, which is the Massachusetts School Building Authority, which will, if we if we go through the whole process, we'll be financing a substantial share of the total cost. There has to be an education program submitted to that. And right now our target date is March, and that preliminary design program will just have a, a range of options, no decisions. It'll say we could do this, we could do that, and it'll lay them out with some preliminary cost estimates. Then between March and June, we have to go from many options down to one, and we have to make a decision. And the we is the town of Amherst, so it's the committee, but uh, there'll be a lot of work done between these with many more community forums so that people can track this as we go along. We're gonna be hopefully taking some staff and teachers out to visit some schools that have been be visit built recently. So people can see elementary schools as they're being built for the next century, not just the last century. And we have to build, this will be the first building in Amherst. Uh, it's a public building that will have to be built to comply with our net zero bylaw, which is the school will be all electric and will use renewables to, um, for its energy sources. So that is gonna be part of the design. It will be also part of the cost. Um, so again, we go move from the preliminary design program, which is lots of options to an option. Then after we select an option, that's when the actual school gets designed. This is still at an early stage in June. And at that point, we're saying, what does it look like? And we have to come up with a concrete cost estimate. And our target is the end of this year. This is a pretty rapid schedule. So I'm going to take this down, but I'd be happy to send this out to anyone who wants this chart. The two, the the community forum on February 3rd will explain more about what this first phase is. And Danisco Design, that is our design team on this, is going to be doing breakout rooms so you can get have small group discussions and questions. So I think if there aren't any questions, I'm going to take my screen down, Michelle, and we move forward. That sounds great. I'm just and, and I will say just one more thing, that as this moves, um, if it's of high interest, I think we're going to be going out to the districts. So this won't be the first time you hear about the school project. We'll bring this back out to the district because we really want all districts. Um, I'm hoping to go be a, a guest speaker at other districts because we really would like people not to say four months from now, I didn't know this was happening. When could I have participated? We're working really hard to make sure people can participate. Hilda has a hand up. Yeah, I, I forget because there's so many details that you guys have to follow. Has the state committed itself to a specific budget, specific sum? No, what, what, what happens Hilda is we go through this initial where we've got lots of options, then we get to preferred, and then we actually do a, enough of a design of a building, we can come up with a cost estimate. That's when the state says what their share will be. And it depends, mm -hmm. on, it depends on whether we've done all new building, whether it's a renovation, you get points. Um, we, the building gets more space for special needs populations. You know, they realize that that takes more space. So there's no advanced commitment to it. They wait to see what we've come up with and you get bonus points if you have some things in your design. Um, so no, there, there is no, there's no commitment good. at the beginning. Yeah. That sounds good given the inflation at the moment. I don't see any other hands here. So um, the next item on our agenda before we open up to a discussion here is just to give you a little bit of an update um, about uh, some work that we're doing, as Kathy said, with neighbors with respect to student residents in Amherst. Um, and so last fall, a group of neighbors met with town officials and reps from the um, public safety, Amherst Public Safety, to discuss ongoing concerns they were having with a fraternity on North Pleasant Street and two houses south of Old Town Road. 
And this um, initial organizing um, meeting led to a neighborhood group organizing. And we have, I think, one of our participants here, Becky Miller, is part of that group. And so um, Kathy and I are working uh, with that group to uh, listen and, and learn about the concerns. And I think Kathy's going to talk a little bit more now about uh, what the next steps for that may be. Yeah, and, and, and I just want to say this was um, a neighborhood that basically raised their hand and said we need help because of an incident that had happened in one of the members' houses. But Sarah and I met a couple years ago with how, uh, people on Harris Street um, and, and around that neighborhood with concerns. Part of it was what rights do we have as people who live here? Who do we call when this happens? Um, how do we get a better relationship? So I think what's starting to come out is this is around town in other districts, it's a concern. It's not a, just a district one concern. And several counselors are looking at, um, are starting to think about, let's look at our current permanent permitting laws. Let's look at our the way we do inspections now around health and safety. And so we're, we're gathering information and ideas from people on do we need something stronger on the books than we currently have. So right, I think most people know you can, you can call the police if there's a party going on at late at night. You can, I mean, oh, Nancy Sardinson was readily saying they're large parties, no one has masks on, isn't anyone enforcing things? So people can call. And what started this latest group uh, meeting was um, in the middle of the night, someone looking for a party was in their house um, asking for directions to the party. You know, so it was a, you know, uh, couldn't find it. And they said, well, it's not here. We're asleep. But, and, and, you know, a high level of alarm. And so we've heard from a couple other neighborhoods. And I think this is just a beginning where we're trying to also let other groups no, um, Jennifer Taub in the uh, di district near to campus has been active with multiple neighbors there around these issues. And we've had town staff, we just had a town staff person come out and talk to us on how do you do inspections? Who do you call? <laughs> um, what can you do? And we're trying to also think of ways of getting UMass to do uh, stronger enforcement. So I think this is more of an announcement than a discussion right now, but this would be a topic if people want to engage in it more, we could make it a district topic and bring more information to you later. Um, Michelle, do you think that's a, a good summary of where we are? I do. I'll just, I'll add in addition to the, some of the policy work that we're looking at, um, we're also looking potentially to formalize an informal counselor liaison to the campus and community coalition group, um, which is made up of um, different high level administrators and other stakeholders. Um, and so I think that if we do move forward with formalizing that, that will also be helpful in dealing with some of these uh, issues. But other than that, I think you covered it, Kathy. So this is this is more in the in the uh, tone of in, an announcement of an emerging set of issues that we're working on. And I didn't invite. I sent out some last minute invitations. There were fifteen people at the um, that earlier meeting that Sarah and I had. So uh, one of the things we thought is we would link people up with each other so that they would know not everyone's in there, you know, at least no others are working on this or interested in whatever people come up with. And there's there's a whole group over in Grantwood in Gris District Two that has been quite active working with a community liaison police officers. So this is pockets of town around town and moving south as houses convert from being single family houses to student houses. Um, so yes, Meg. Okay. Yeah. I think there's also a carrot side of the stick, carrot stick, that there are a lot of students uh, in our neighborhoods who are fantastic and also don't like those parties. And we could do a better job of bringing them into these conversations and inviting them to our backyard parties and knowing when their birthdays are and things like that uh, as a way of creating allies uh, in this 
uh, challenge that we've been, that is part of living here. I don't think it's gonna go away, but um, I well, think we've, we've made allies enough of the many, many students who we see out on the trails and running and skiing and skating on puffers who, who don't like this behavior any more than we do. Well, and, and you know, one of the things that uh, the Bill Laramie has gone out to communities is he's, he starts introducing people to each other, Meg, too. So when you, you know your neighbors, you, you're more likely to treat them as neighbors and be part of a community. So it's both parts. You know, there's a carrot side of familiarity and, um, you know, if the houses turn over, you have to do it each year, you know, go ahead and, and introduce yourself. But the Harris neighborhood, when I went back and knocked on doors to say, how were things going for this last election? They said much better, you know, that they, you know, what you were just saying, we have, we have really good houses right now, very um, respectful of the rest of us, uh, at least, you know, as of October. So a lot of them are trying to be grownups. Yeah, mm, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really great recommendation, Meg, just to um, sort of capture the the folks, the students that are that are in the same boat with us, and um, hoping to keep the neighborhood safe. And and um, so I, I just want to make one more announcement to some folks who just entered. If you would like to be brought into the room, please raise your hand. I would also like to recognize Rep. Mindy Dom, who I'm going to bring in right now as being here. See here. All right. Great. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> so Mindy, thanks for being here. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for including making this an inclusive meeting so that I can drop in. I'm sorry I was late. Well, well, thank you for everything you do. Um, for us and <laughs> including show up on a Sunday afternoon at a district meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. So I think, yeah. so I think Hilda has a question. No, Hilda wants to tell you that you're missing the biggest part of the student problem. It's not a student problem. It's not a UMass problem. It's a management problem. And I know this, situation pretty well. I haven't had problems in 45 years or more because my students and tenants know what the expectations are. You have to get contact with all of these newbies who decided a good way to invest their money is on Amherst Housing. And they're the ones that need to be educated. And they're the ones that need to crack down on their tenants. Make the expectations very clear. When before you get anywhere near showing an apartment, signing a lease, talking on the phone, you tell them that cockroaches' famous favorite food is beer. You can't leave empty beer cans. I tell them that, <laughs> and they weed themselves out. If they don't want to live by my rules, they don't live in my apartment. They they choose to go somewhere else where the landlord don't care. So I mean, that's the population you guys need to look at. There are so many new people. And I know this from being assessor. I know this from being uh, on the zoning board. People, management, that they, they don't know what they're doing. They think they can just collect the rent and ignore the tenant. It don't work. So you need to look at that population. They, we had an organization a few years ago, but they've been very quiet. We haven't done anything about it lately, but... but um, those are the people you need to reach out to first. Don't blame the kids. Right. They do what they get away with. Yeah. They don't know it's a problem. They're not told it's a problem. And they don't know that the landlord will take it seriously. So that's the end of my lecture. Thank you, Hilda. Thank you, Hilda. Uh, I see another hand, Lisa. You need to unmute, Lisa. You were unmuted, but I think you muted sorry. yourself. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, I just want to say it's both the students and some absentee or irresponsible landlords. Being a landlord myself, um, you know, I only have so much control over my tenants, and there's not always the enforcement. Not that I've had the problems, but I don't think that 
the behavior of some of the tenants should always be put on the landlord. At the same point, I am seeing plenty of situations as I'm screening prospective tenants that are coming from properties that are not properly managed, not registered. Um, you know, looking at property cards that for unregistered properties where it's under a trust and it's saying owner occupied and the tenants are paying rent to somebody in New Jersey they don't even know the last name of. So um, my feeling is that there needs to be enforcement of the policies we have with the property owners that are not properly managing their property. At the same point, I feel like, you know, there does need to be help managing the younger population everywhere. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Lisa. And you know, the pandemic has really brought uh, this whole other layer to things. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's a lot on both sides. Um, and just to broadly announce, Kathy, uh, so this is the portion of our agenda where we are opening it up, <laughs> yeah. um, discussion about any matter. So um, if you would like to um, raise your hand, please. I think we, I think Mary. Um, yeah, has and Becky, Becky has her hand up just, it's her actual hand hand as opposed to the cute little right. icon. <laughs> so. I can't find the icon. <laughs> Sometimes you have to go to oh, reactions. Okay. <laughs> so let's go Mary and then Becky. And Lisa, if you could take your hand down after, just so we know whether you put it up again. That'd be great. Thanks. Hi, can you hear me? It's Mary Sayer on Pine Street. Um, one thing that wasn't on the agenda, and um, I think it's kind of telling that it's not, is the North Amherst Library. Uh, edition. And I'm really frustrated. There's a lot of people that are really frustrated about this. And it keeps sliding off the radar of everybody because there's a lot of other things. But this is a project that's what um, a small addition to a town building. It's four and a half years in the process. The town has the money. The town has done the architects. The town has gone through the planning board and public meetings. Um, we still have not had this go out to bid. And every time I call the town, my, the response has been, oh yeah, we're really excited about this project. And uh, we just have to get the bid documents together and then blah, 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 blah. Um, I don't think putting bid documents together should take three months, which so far it has. And um, if we don't get the bid documents out to the contractors within the next few weeks, they're going to be too busy. They're busy now looking at bid propositions from other people. And I would hate the town to come back to me and say, oh, gee, uh, we were hoping to do it this spring, but uh, the contractors were busy. So maybe next fall we could um, see to it. Uh, I, I really feel I'm being fobbed off by the town. Um, we, it's unbelievable that we have a donor that's willing to do this for North Amherst. And it feels disrespectful to the town that it seems to go way down on the list. So I'm hoping that you guys can talk to Sean and Paul and Guilford or whoever needs to be talked to and get the ball rolling so that these documents are out within the next couple of weeks. Thanks, Mary. Um, any but, questions? <laughs> well, I asked I asked that question at the end of a long meeting on Monday night, and Paul said just a few more things needed to be done. But I totally agree, and I think Michelle and I can do it in a united way. And I've got Andy on the screen. I mean, there's a lot of us that use this North Amherst Library, and not only do we not want to be too late, but to the extent that donor has put up their money and the stock market is oscillating around it's not and the, and, and we and you know we've got um prices going up rapidly on things um yeah. so i'm afraid paul's gonna fob you off too it sounds like his response to, be, to you was exactly the response to me which is well we just have a few more things to do and then well it was um, it was supposed to be ready to go in november so something yeah, exactly i don't know i know they needed a, a legal thing about the exit so they've gotten that um, but that was a month ago. Um, okay, so so we will, we can both do it together as an email. And if we need to, we can raise it again in a public meeting, um, you know, to stay on it. 
So thank you for raising it. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mary. Becky. Right, hi. Um, so we are jumping around a little bit here because um, I want to go back to the question about the student rentals in our neighborhoods. Um, as much as I love the North Amherst Library, so I'm right with you there. But, um, you know, a number of us on this committee that um, has basically been put together, I'd say over the last three months, feel strongly that UMass has a, a housing problem. They, they have too many students, they cannot house them, and their problem becomes our problem. This is historic. This is hardly the first time. Um, as uh, somebody mentioned, this is a problem based on you know the fact that we live in a college town. So clearly the answers are not going to be easy or necessarily even forthcoming. But the issue, as we see it, a lot of people on this committee see it, is that UMass has a housing problem that they're not really addressing satisfactorily for lots of reasons, um, lots of examples of that. And they are unresponsive when we approach them and say, you know, your problem cannot be put on our backs. We live here, we pay our taxes. We live with the, the, peop the students who break into our houses, who are drunk, who urinate publicly, who you know throw trash around, who make unbelievable amounts of noise. I mean, it's become a really big issue. And um, the people who make those decisions at UMass do not live in these neighborhoods. They don't have to live with this. So one of our main aims is to ask the town to help us leverage um, the town and our interest with UMass to bring UMass into a more um, generative um, role in solving this problem. Because right now it's this kind of neoliberal thing like, okay, here's a problem, you know, go make cookies, go make nice with your neighbors. You know, of course, it's nice to introduce ourselves as students, but you know, we're not. You know, we're busy people, and we can't necessarily do that all the time. And um, frankly, a lot of people in our neighborhood don't really want to do that. It sounds kind of mean, but you know, we shouldn't necessarily be the police. So that's that's what we're asking the town to do. That's why we have come to you to um, ask us to help involve you, Mass, in this issue because right now they are so far away from it. Thank you. So any, you know, we don't have to, you know, we, we scheduled the first meeting with a broad wide open rather than trying to uh, take time with things we thought you might want to hear about, but we would be happy to hear future issues to put on an agenda for topics that you wish we'd been talking about before, what things you would like to be regularly updated on. Um, I'm just throwing out a broad range. You know, you see the committees we're on, that means because we're on finance, we will know when the budget is moving, what decisions have been made about the budget. Um, the, the Joint Capital Planning Committee is where the decisions get made about um, with the large backlog that we have of roads, sidewalks, uh, equipment, what can we afford to buy each year? Um, so, but we would be happy to schedule meetings to address topics. And um, I'm just, I'm looking at Ruth's face, um, it, Ruth, because I can see you. And, you know, several years ago, we talked about we are, North Amherst is the proud home of lots of farms. You know, we benefit a lot from the Amherst history with farms. We've never actually focused on the farm district or farm issues. So I'm, I'm just kind of throwing out kinds of topics that fit district one. Meg has been doing a lot of work on envisioning North Amherst as with John Gerber and others, we could also bring that work in and feature it at a district meeting. So this is just, we're open to a broad range of topics and particularly anything where council action would help um, or could strengthen it. And to add to that, um, and Becky, sort of to follow up with what you were talking about, we can have 
special guests or presenters at these district one meetings. Um, so if trying to bring somebody into the room to have a discussion about a particular topic seems like it would be helpful, we can certainly arrange for that. So um, maybe we wanna think about with respect to our student residents and the problems that and concerns that we're having around that, who we might want to bring into or invite to a district one meeting um, to, to sort of specifically talk about that. Um, I also wanted to say that we were hoping, uh, although I don't think we asked Meg in advance, but if Meg would take a couple minutes to talk a little bit about DONA, um, if you don't know about the District 1 Neighborhood Association, you should. And so maybe if Meg would um, just take a couple minutes uh, at some point in this discussion to tell folks about DONA, what they're involved with, and, um, and how you can engage more uh, with District 1 initiatives. I could do that now. Uh, I wasn't sure. Sure. planning to, but I'm happy to. And I'll, I'll, make, I'll keep it brief. So the District 1 Neighborhood Association, or DONA, is- And uh, here. What? Speak a little louder, Meg. Oh, sorry. Other people, I wonder what's up. Oops. Um, the District 1 Neighborhood Association, or DONA, is uh, an organization of people, residents who live in District 1, who come together to uh, address issues of safety and concern, to help people participate in town matters that affect them, help people know how to participate, and that means letting them know when things are coming up, and also to build community. So before COVID, we had potlucks and uh, big discussion groups about issues that were um, happening. And now we are doing that more on Zoom and also in committees. Uh, we're now forming a reforming a planning committee that's going to look at the town master plan and figure out how that, what that means for district one and really for all of North Amherst in terms of uh, safe streets, uh, transportation, uh, uh, development that meets the needs of residents uh, and so on. So if people are interested in participating in that, let us know. Uh, John Gerber, who's in my screen right in the middle, is uh, creating a nature trail that will go from the Renaissance Center and explore a whole bunch of wonderful things about District 1. It'll go through the University Agricultural. Well, John, you could describe it. Uh, Renaissance Center, UMass, a uh, little private land, um, Simple Gifts, Mill River out to uh, Cushman. And uh, we're waiting on uh, Dave Zomack offered to uh, get the town attorney to uh, craft a, 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 st a release statement, basically, so they can protect private landowners from any kind of liability. And we're waiting on that. Uh, most everyone's agreed to it. We just got to get the documents in place, and then we'll go public with it. Right. We're also, the Community Preservation Act has given us a small grant to begin developing the uh, a history trail along the Mill River that'll go from uh, the rec Mill River Recreation Area all the way to the Cushman Common, which is uh, where there have were over the years dozens and dozens of mills that have some of them have cellar holes and remnants. Uh, in 1775, there were six mills along the river already, uh, and uh, we're going to create a right go the trail already exists a history trail that will be interpretive we'll have a website and a qr codes on the signs that'll link to the website so people will be able to see a lot of pictures and read history and learn about the people uh, who lived there and we're working with amherst media to do a parallel video series uh, we're right now looking for a host of that uh, i just taped the first one with Pete Kozlowskis, who's a 98-year-old man who lives on Summer Street. He's lived there all of, since 1936 uh, and worked uh, in the sawmill that was where uh, Mill Hollow Apartments is now. And he remembers Puffer's Pond, uh, the ice business where they harvested ice off Puffer's Pond this time of year and used it in the summer. Uh, with him and Barbara Puffer Garnier together, the two of them uh, interviewed, it was really amazing because her father, Steve Puffer, was the person who hired Pete Kozlowskis to do all sorts of things, including drive a school bus and 
uh, Barbara sat as the first grader in the seat right behind Pete because she uh, loved to sit there with him. Anyway, this is a video that we did and we're gonna do a bunch of videos of people who have memories of the area. And again, as I said, we're looking for a uh, charismatic person with a mellifluous voice to be the, uh, <laughs> the host of it. Uh, so there are several other things we're planning, but if you would like to be on our mailing list, we have a website. Uh, you can find it by going searching for district uh, uh, district one. Oh, we're so lucky that our district starts with a vowel because our acronym is something you can say. It's the only number that starts with a vowel. So D-O-N-A and uh, you can get on our mailing list. We don't use it very much and we it's a small list because and we don't give it to anybody. We don't use it for anything other than uh, matters that affect district one, like this meeting, for example, we used our email list. Um, I, I could go on, but I want to keep it short, which Thank I already you, didn't Meg. do. <laughs> and also recognizing Jessica Mix Barrington, who is now in the room, who is also part of the steering committee for DONA yep. or okay. And great. Mary, Mary Sarah Mary Sarah also is here. Excellent. Okay. We're looking for more people to get active. If you'd like to be this, be part of what we're trying to do, let us know. Our, we're, our steering committee is actually fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, as we as we are waiting for any other suggestions people might have, one, um, one of the people I see who has joined joined us is Brianna Owen, and I don't know whether people know Brianna, but she was one of the leaders um, that has helped brought in uh, an alternative workforce to the police that we are just starting to talk about how we implement it. And so that would be, um, there have been a couple forums that have talked about the implementation plan. When Michelle said we can bring people to a district meeting as that gets further along, we could bring in spokespeople to say, how is this actually gonna work? Um, would this be, is there a phone number I would call in the following situation, you know, as we work this out? Because um, it went from an idea to becoming a reality really fast. I mean, we haven't hired people yet, but it's, it's something that we'll be putting Amherst on the map with a handful of other communities um, saying we don't have to, when people call for help, it's not always and often not a response of someone with a gun. Um, it's a different kind of crisis response team that we're bringing in. So I'm just, Ruth has raised her hand and Nancy, it looks like I've talked long enough to spark some ideas here. So uh, I'll stop. Maybe, I don't know whose hand went up first, maybe Nancy and then Ruth, yeah. And Nancy's been up quite a while, I noticed, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, First of all, I, I just want to give a shout out to you, Kathy. Um, I've been watching. I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever seen as much social media and out there stuff as you have done with the elementary program and building program. And I just want to give a shout out to um, how wonderful that is to see. I know it's a tremendous amount of work, but um, I'm very impressed with the work that you guys have done. And secondly, this is just a comment of, as we're talking about students, and I know in, in the students, when you talk to, to people who live in, in District 1 or North Amherst, you know, we're preaching to the choir about students, but I just want to remind people that there is a, there, there are amongst students, women students, issues of sexual assault that are taking place on town property. Okay, so it's our issue. They've made it our issue. And that's a deep concern to me. That's not a university issue. That's, our, that's a town issue. It's taking place on town property. And um, I just have not been <clears throat> particularly uh, thrilled with what I've seen in terms of the town's response. And I do think we have a responsibility for that. But my real question, actually, I'm really glad Mindy's here. And also you, Michelle. I went to the statewide uh, reparation meeting a week or so ago, and and Amkar Shabazz was talking about you not being able to spend town money until something happens at the state, and he was going <laughs> and and I haven't been able to figure out what this is. Um, I talked to Joe Comerford; she has no idea. She she didn't really know what this was about, and and I'm just kind of 
Um, I, as long as I got the two of you here, I think Mindy, your name was mentioned. <laughs> also somebody who was doing something about it, but it appears that it might not be an issue. I don't know. I'd appreciate an answer. Yeah, I, I, Mindy, I don't know if you, I, I, I would love to answer directly about that meeting because I was there and I, so I could speak directly to what Dr. Shabazz was talking about. So I think there was some, there was some confusion in what Dr. Shabazz was presenting at the meeting. Um, and so the, we've talked since then. Um, I think what he was saying is uh, we received, the town received a legal opinion that gave us three pathways for distributing reparations funds. And one of the pathways was to create a home rule petition or special legislation that would define reparations as a public purpose and give some um, detail to how reparations should or could be distributed. Um, and that would be a process that the town council, so we would we would create the special legislation or the home rule petition and the town council would have to approve it. And then it would go over to Mindy and Mindy would, um, it would take it through the process there. Um, but it's important to know that that was only one of the three recommendations or potential pathways for distributing. So the way that I sort of read what Dr. Shabazz was saying was that that was the only way. And I, 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 I uh, so I want to clarify that that is not the only way, although the town lawyer does feel it will be the most efficient and effective and clean way of doing it. Um, because as we're seeing already in Evanston with their distribution of reparations funds, they're facing legal challenges. So, and then if Mindy, if you have something to add to that, uh, that thank, was- Thank you, Michelle. First of all, I just really wanna shout out Michelle's work on this. Um, I mean, she's an example, you know, I know she's gonna be a terrific town counselor, but she's been a terrific community activist and volunteer in this role. and. I know as a resident of Amherst, I feel really indebted to her facilitation skills, <laughs> as well as her commitment and her understanding of the issue. I really, and is also someone who supports reparations. I'm glad that she's at the helm and that she's continuing to play that role um, moving forward. Um, so I think that, first of all, I wanna say a couple of things and the town councilors will have to correct me if I'm wrong. I do think that the town manager has already put aside some town funds for yeah. reparations. And he and the council are able to do that without legislation, just to be clear. Um, I think we're talking about if there's a bigger program that um, the town envisions that requires more resources, then what do you do? I also think there's other town pockets of money that can be used to support different activities related to um, reparations. And that might be things like the local cultural council, which gets money from the state, but it's decisions based are local or you know, other kinds of funds that maybe are state funds that come through the town that can be used for very specific activities. And as someone who used to write grants for nonprofits and nonprofit services, I'm really aware that sometimes a program, I'm not saying reparations needs this, but just generally, um, programs are like a patchwork of grant sources. Like you look at what a program is and you say, okay, so what are all the potential sources of funding that could be devoted to it? And I can see already that in Amherst, we're doing that with reparations where, you know, we want to do this kind of program. Well, we have this pocket of money that funds this kind of program. Maybe we can access it there. And I think the more we tap into those kinds of sources, the more inclusive we are of different communities, quite frankly, in Amherst who may or may not be aware of reparations and it's a good way to build support um, for reparations across the community. So I'm looking forward to doing that. And I, of course, will take any baton that the council passes to me for a home rule. Um, home rules are generally, some of you may know this, I didn't know this before I got to the state house. There's a lot of things that towns need permission from the state to do whether it's a particular liquor license exemption, a, a sick leave bank for a state agency, uh, a way to create a transfer fee or different taxes. There's like lots of different reasons why towns may need home rules. We have a home rule in Amherst right now that's sitting in the elections committee to move us forward on ranked choice voting, for example. 
Um, and I, I am more than happy as the rep, I see it as my job to pick up whatever the council gives me as a home rule and to advocate it for it and to shepherd it along with Senator Comerford. A lot of home rules start in the house, which is why they come to me because sometimes they include money. Um, they don't have to start in the house if they don't, but I, Senator Comerford and I see it as our basic responsibility in terms of advocating for our municipalities is to, if you pass a home rule is to give it to us and for us to champion it at the state house and to try to get it passed. So I think that's my explanation. I hope that was clear. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And thank you again for all your work. Thank you, yeah. Um, and so thank you, Mindy. Before we take any more questions, I just would like to ask Rob Kuzner, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, um, has a hand up and I'm wondering if if you'd like to be brought in, please keep your hand up for a moment and I will bring you in. If not, just lower it for the moment and I'll know. Can I also just say one other thing while you're bringing someone in? Yeah. And that's Michelle and I and the other members of the reparations committee, I just wanna really be clear that we have been in conversation about this at their initiative um, and a credit to their initiative. And I look forward to those continued conversations. Thanks, Mindy. Thank you so much, Mindy. Yeah. So, so Michelle, I see both Ruth and Jessica have their hand up to talk. Yeah, you go ahead and facilitate that while I try okay. to get Rob in here. <laughs> okay. So Ruth, Ruth, you're on. Thank you. I I um I wanted to say I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I like the idea of having some uh, some more information about the community safety committee. Is that the right name of it? Um, and the process of that, I think that's a really good thing for um, all of us to, to know more about, and I really support it. So the more we know about it, the better we can support it. Um, I also uh, really, um, am, I'm interested in, like, I, I appreciate so much the outreach that you're doing just to do this meeting, and I would love to see more people know about it and more people come. So I'm thinking that that's something we could all work together to support you in making that happen. Um, and if you, you know, if you have ideas about that, it would be, you know, let's try to build the community that is actively connecting with you because um, it's really wonderful to, to do this. This is what we want, right? So um, I guess uh, I had a little invitation there from Kathy to, to bring up questions about, um, about farming and, and, and food. And what's interesting and discouraging is that we do have an agricultural commission, which was formed by town meeting um, in line with uh, guidance from the, the state about uh, agricultural commissions, but it's, it's faltering um, from lack of interest in participating in it. So, um, I'm wondering um, if we, if it would be useful to look at the charge of that commission, to talk to the people who have been on it, to talk to the farmer, you know, somehow engage with farmers. I think it, it's, it was uh, initially um, charged with being a voice for farmers, for people who earn their livelihood through farming. And we do have a lot of those people in this town so I, I'm a little bit concerned that there's a disconnect between this body that could speak for them and the people who it's charged with speaking uh, for. So that, that's one issue, but one of the things I'm wondering about, because there are other kinds of issues around the food system that are being addressed somewhat um, by you know by things like the um, mobile market under the auspices of Healthy Hampshire, um, and there's growing interest in you know reviving community gardens in the town and making them more accessible. Um, there's a newly forming food po Hampshire County Food Policy Council, which is going to be um, working with some of these issues around food access and food um, equity. It, it seems like there are, you know, potentially a lot of 
parts and pieces. There's also the question of are all of our conservation lands that are owned by the town, some of that land is suitable for agriculture. How is that being managed? Is that being adequately invested in, in terms of preserving public land for the purpose of um, producing food in a time when we may, we should be thinking about long-term resilience. So I, I kind of wonder if there, I don't know if you hear any energy around, you know, or concern about the, the fact that the Ag Commission doesn't have enough people to even have a quorum at a meeting. And I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, it's not just that, I mean, why are people not interested in it? I'm thinking that maybe it needs to be looked at in a different way and perhaps broaden. I don't, I don't really know, but there's also people looking for ways to get the town involved in, in broader food system issues. So I just think that some conversations about those issues would be really useful. And I've mentioned them to various people. I'll, I guess I'll keep mentioning them. <laughs> um, so I, I think, you know, just in response, you know, I, I mentioned briefly to Michelle, we'd had this conversation. Maybe we can talk later on how we would explore the two things that you've raised. You know, why has the interest died out? Is there something with the charge? Are there other issues? Um, and we can just do something behind the scenes. The issue of community lands, and I, Mindy, Mindy over at the Survival Center and her successor have been amazing with food supply. But I think we could schedule a district meeting where we could get Dave Zomach or someone from conservation to say what might be possible, what is possible, you know, what are they doing? So we would, we would know, um, is there something we need to do? Again, we need to do it at a council level to make something happen. We don't write charges of standing committees, but we do periodically or have asked periodically wonder why uh, committees that don't seem very active, do we still need that committee? Does its mission need to change? And that's a different, um, that's actually right over in GOL with you, Michelle, I think. You know, so we, so let us get back to you just on whether we can bring this back in some way um, on the two issues you brought up. So we, we bought a piece of land with CPA money just off 116 and it, it, it unites two um, pieces of land we already owned. It was part of a prior former farm. And when CPA voted for it, Dave Zomek was talking about community farms on that parcel as potential. But to my knowledge, it, that hasn't happened. And I heard one pay, person say they wasn't sure there was any water on the property, which would make it difficult um, But because it's just off the highway. But, but let's get, just get back to you. I think it's a great topic if we can figure out how to uh, do, bring it back. Um, thank you. And it looks like maybe Rep. John yeah. hand up the, in relation to this. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry, I just want to say if I, I want to offer my assistance to Ruth as well as to the council people in pulling people together on this. Um, my office has sort of had a food security meeting in Granby um, during COVID, like every four to six weeks to sort of touch base on the intersection of not only the food pantries in the area, but the farms. Um, and I'm more than happy to play a role if I can in supporting this kind of convening of uh, a food systems sort of discussion for Amherst. Um, I think it's it's really interesting because we do, we have a lot of conservation land, which may, parts of it may be able to be used for community farms. We have a, a new community farm that's actually going up um, in South Amherst. We have a lot of regular farms, not community farms, but CESA related farms, you know, a sustainable ag agriculture. Um, and we are a leader in a lot of these efforts. So it's an interesting idea is to pull it together and try to re-energize it. Ruth, I love that idea. So I just wanna say I'm available to help in any way. If my office can be helpful in convening people, um, bringing other experts in maybe from MDAR or DCR, if we wanna look at what can be done, I don't know. I mean, Dave Zomek is the local expert. So, um, but if there's a need to bring in the state to sort of, um, provide us with an understanding of what other towns do, I'm happy to, I would love to be part of that. Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you. Thank so you. Jessica. Hi, I have two things. Uh, you probably can't read this. It's amherstdonut.org. 
which is the email, it's, it's the uh, website address, amherstdona.org. And our email address is contact us, all one word, at amherstdona.org. Um, I suggest for a future meeting that we talk about transportation in North Amherst and um, perhaps have a visioning session where people who live um, on our streets can say what they are seeing and say how our streets could be better configured to help them do what they want to do. Um, so that's my suggestion. Thank you. Great, thank you. Rob, it's a nice segue probably to Rob, Rob Kusner. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, I, uh, I'm in the cloud here, but uh, I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, yeah, Jessica, thanks for that suggestion. Uh, yeah, at some point, I, I hope the town uh, in a broader way will come back to uh, a public forum on transportation and transit, et cetera. And I hope that the meeting Jessica is suggesting, since North Amherst is closely connected to uh, one of the destinations, namely the university, I hope that we'll invite lots of people uh, throughout the town to that, to our meeting. I, I want to come back actually to Ruth's uh, comment. Uh, I had a few other things, but we're getting late here and I was late to join. Um, within the last decade, I believe um, the conservation department sent out RFPs for interested, let's call the people farmers, but agricultural interest in uh, renting land for a year or several years. And I'd like to know actually if anyone, maybe Ruth knows or anyone else, maybe John knows, whether any of those proposals, um, whether any of those calls for proposals ever received um, applications. Because I, I do a lot of hiking and biking around town. There are many places um, uh, you know, near Old Farm Road, near, uh, uh, I guess it's uh, near the Fort River, which Cambodian farmers used to use, they now have some private land that they're using uh, off Stanley Street. I'm just wondering whether those RFPs were, you know, whether the, the proposed rental fee was too high to attract farmers, you know, whatever, whatever knowledge anyone here has or might take back to Dave Zomek or discuss at the meeting that Ruth is proposing, I hope that will be a, a useful starting point because there, there, there have been efforts re relatively recently to have some of the farmland in the town be actively farmed. Thanks, Rob. Meg? I'm, I'm thinking that's the next hand I see. Is that right, Michelle? Meg, yeah. Um, just quickly, some other, this is wonderful. Thank you. Topics for future discussions for District 1. Um, there's a lot happening around zoning and the focus and the discussion in the paper and so on. It sounds like it's mostly about downtown, but I know that it's not. Some of the zoning applies to everywhere. It would be really helpful to have a kind of uh, tutorial on or uh, what the zoning d discussions are when they're being made and what impact they would have on District 1, particularly our village center uh, but also that it's all connected, the uh, students, <laughs> housing, transportation, it's all of a piece. The second thing that would be just to put a, a little heads up, uh, we've been in discussion very, very uh, casually with the Mill District about a plan for Cherry Hill year round, the golf course and uh, raising money to make it a winterized venue where we might have evening events, maybe have a bar, maybe have, uh, this is gonna really sound crazy, but snow making equipment so we can have all the time skiing and so on. But it's just something that is a resource for district one that we aren't using fully because it's not winterized and it's, it's a shabby building and the town owns it. <clears throat> um, on the, uh, farming thing, I'm totally, it's great that's come up in such a robust way at this meeting. Some of us have been trying to figure out a way of buying of the Mitchell property that's uh, where the eruptor was going to be that would uh, keep it as farmland in some way. And there are a lot of different ideas and there's quite a bit of funding available around state money uh, for this board, but we need a plan. Uh, 
I'm not going to go into what some of the ideas are, but um, uh, it's really, it's farmland. It's some of the best farmland around. And so that's another topic. Uh, and I just thank Kathy for your leadership on the school building project. We really, this school building is so crucial. We need to have it. And you've, your leadership, your transparency, the energy with which that you've brought to it is fantastic. And I just hope everybody's going to get behind you and it, and we're going to have a school in a few years. And thanks to Michelle for so enthusiastically jumping into leading our district. Thank you. And uh, I really appreciate Mindy. You're just awesome showing up on a Sunday afternoon and knowing what's going on about so many things. And uh, we're so lucky to have you and Joe and, and Kathy and Michelle as our elected leaders. We're really, you know, we're really uh, lucky in district one and in Amherst. Um, Thanks, thanks, Meg. Um, I just, I wanna, Mandy's hand is up and I wanna make sure we leave a few minutes just to ask about how frequently, frequency, times of day, days of the week for future meetings. So I, and, and just if an idea comes to you, please just send it to us too. This is not, this is the only time you can talk. So Andy. Yes, hi. Uh First of all, thank you for including me in the meeting. And uh, I try and attend uh, district meetings for all of the districts when I have the opportunity because as a counselor at large, I'm elected town wide and I really therefore am in the position of wanting to know what are the issues that are of concern to um, every district and uh, that I really appreciated just listening today. The one thing I wanted to mention because it didn't come up, um, I'm on the town services and outreach committee and uh, there was a matter that pertains to North Amherst that was referred to that committee and it was not dealt with within the last council, but was held over and will be dealt with probably um, within the next uh, six uh, months or so. And that is uh, the design of the sidewalk along North Pleasant Street. And uh, there will be public forum. There has to be a public forum at some point regarding that. Uh, and uh, I will keep, uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, Kathy and Michelle uh, are informed of what TSO is doing with that um, so that uh, the um, design option that um, has been put forward by the Department of Public Works is available for people who are interested. It's a rather complex document to look at that it is available and uh, that we can get um, um, input in it. So that was the only thing I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Andy. And uh, Kathy, I just want to make you aware there is somebody in the attendees, Mary Lynn Busgarden, that would that has had a hand up for quite a while. Um, so, uh, and I also see we have Hilda and Rob, and uh, let's see, and Mary as well. So, so we if Mary's hand, if Mary Lynn's hand has been up for a while, I'm going to just allow her to talk. Perfect. So, Mary, Mary Lynn, I want to. You are now part of us for talking. If you want to unmute, you can talk. Hi. Hi there. I actually unmuted. <laughs> um, so um, I, actually, uh, Andy provides a really great segue for my comment. And it uh, is, it's kind of a follow up to your last town council meeting. And that's on utility services to the town. And there was an interesting article in the News Gazette that some of you may have seen I think it was yesterday or Friday on the power pole placement and uh, what we had and and it also kind of pertain my thoughts also kind of pertain to some of the other town issues. Um, what we have going on on Rolling Ridge right now is we have a neighbor who would like to keep who has to upgrade their power. And it was one of those older homes on Rolling Ridge that started out with one power level and now has to go up to 220 or whatever the number is. And uh, all the utilities to the houses on Rolling Ridge are underground. 
And um, if, and that's really the, from the poll to the house, that's the homeowner's responsibility. And we had talked to Eversource because it has to go from the poll across the road to the homeowner's property. And um, which is unfortunate, but hopefully there's a conduit under there, which we don't know. And I thought that was kind of interesting when we talked to the power company, because you might just be able to uh, uh, pull the line through the conduit. But um, but the so we're hoping we can, you know, when utilities are already underground, and as was pointed out in the newspaper article, it's also um, an issue of avoiding power outages. If the if we can keep the wires underground, because there are quite a few trees about because what Eversource wants to do is rather than running the wire above uh, underground, they want to run it and they want to put in another pole and which would clutter the road and run the wire above ground, which there's trees that would potentially knock the power out to our neighbors. So, but the larger issue that struck me in all of and also in some of these conversations is um, policy development for the town. Because sometimes I think these issues come up like the one Andy just brought up about the sidewalks. Um, you know, we're, we, I think the, and I said on town meeting for many years is that we end up doing some of these things ad hoc on a policy, on an issue by issue basis rather than having a uh, strong, you know, either town planning policies in place or zoning policies in place. So we don't have to go through the, the these same conversations over and over again. I know there's nuances to each conversation. Um, I'm not naive about that, but um, it would still be nice to have policies that guide like outside utility companies like Eversource that can come in like the 10 ton gorilla and say, Oh, we're going to do it this way. Well, Eversource's resolution was, oh yeah, you can run it underground from the pole to the house and under the road, but it's going to be at the homeowner's expense. And I'm going, wait a minute, where's Eversource's responsibility in this? And that's not uncommon for power companies to do that. They've done this in other towns as well. So um, anyway, that that was the one thought I really wanted to share is I would encourage, um, you know, if we could do any, I would encourage Kathy, you're doing a great job. I've been really totally impressed with your representation, Michelle. I look forward to your contributions. And I just hope, you know, we can move forward and develop, help the town develop policies so we can do things in more planful ways so it doesn't end up looking like a campus town. And then it looks like a coordinated, um, integrated town that integrates all the different populations within Amherst and can bring everybody together as a community. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Marilyn. So I, I just wanna do a time check. We have three more hands up um, and um, we're, I, want, I would like to stop at five because we said we were going to stop at five. If we don't get to discussion of future meeting things, if everyone who's here can just send us thoughts, um, you know, is there a preference for a Sunday afternoon? Would you like mo monthly? Uh, we looked at our schedules and Tuesday and Wednesday nights are okay. Um, so if we could send us thoughts, we won't have a discussion about that. And I see the three people, Michelle, I'm looking at you too. Should we just three more people and then we're, we'll close it down. So each of you be as short as possible because we're, um, we only have a few minutes till five o'clock. So Rob, I think your hand went back up and then I see it Mary Singer and Hilda. It did. I'll do it in 30 seconds. Uh, first, Kathy, thanks for you and Allison chairing the uh, school building committee, please bring some of the thoughts there on site, which site to choose to the TAC, because I think transportation, particularly the availability of public transportation to whatever new school site is essential. So I hope that'll be one place. And I actually reviewed the plans of the 
sidewalk, multi-use path, whatever that Andy was referring to just informally with the chair of the TAC last fall. I think there's still a lot of work to do on that. And again, I hope the TAC will also, this is the Transportation Advisory Committee, I guess that's what TAC is, will have a chance to look at it more. Because I think there's a lot of, a lot of moving parts there. Uh, having spent nearly a decade getting the Norwalk Rail Trail redesigned and rebuilt back in the 2006 to 2016 era. There are a lot of details we should try to get right on North Pleasant Street. A lot of folks there walk, a lot of folks bicycle, a lot of folks ride buses there. It's a really multi-use corridor and it's become more important with all the new housing up, uh, up at the old mill. So, all right, thanks. Thank you, Mary. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, I wanted to um, also address the, um, the, the sidewalk issue in the sense that um, if you live in North Amherst, I think we really would like to see sort of, I don't know what the word is, seminal plans so that there actually can be a discussion rather than a kind of, uh, here's what we're gonna do. Do you have any comments on it? Because I think there can be a feeling in, in North Amherst, it's about the intersection also, that there's sort of a presentation of plans and it's almost gone too far to really, you know, because then the answer is, oh, well, we'd have to reconfigure everything if you want a four foot wide sidewalk. So I just wanna make sure that we're in on it early enough. So those comments, uh, I, I saw those plans, I don't know, I can't remember, it was in the autumn, but they weren't well publicized. Um, my guess is that most people in North Amherst don't know that this is going to happen. So I really encourage the counselors to get those plans out there at an early enough stage so you can have real, real input into it. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Hilda. Are you calling on me? Yes. Yes. Well, but no. I have to put my foot in it. Um, I have to re respond this whole issue of North Amherst sidewalks. We have been waiting for a fire station since 1976. Town can't seem to manage to get that done. People on East Pleasant, well, 1976 was when the North Amherst fire station opened and we, we started talking about a South Amherst fire station. There's no fire station, no place to put it. I mean, after all these years. The people on East Pleasant Street have no sidewalks at all. And they've been nagging and nagging to do something about because of all the kids that walk there, including now with the affordable apartments and stuff. A lot of kids walk and there are bus stops there. Why are we going off on another project to build more sidewalks where there already are sidewalks on both sides of the street on North Pleasant Street? I just don't get it. There are, doesn't seem to be any priorities. It doesn't seem like anything can get done. It looks like the people they're hiring in town hall don't know what they're doing. And all the old people who have been there and are retiring because they're being all the work. And things just don't seem to be happening. Um, and, and so my, my big question, I guess, at the end of that rant is, why are we looking at rebuilding North Pleasant Street when East Pleasant Street hasn't been done yet and they need it? So um, I think um, I wrote that down. Um, for those of you who haven't been at earlier meetings, there actually was a resident proposal that was approved in 2018 for the beginning study. Yeah, I know. Study. That's as and long as we've been working on a library. And, and so it was approved. Andy was on the JCPC when it was approved, and it never got implemented. But I heard that it is going to be implemented. So I think it's something that we can bring, Hilda. So just... I think we can bring it to TAC, Andy, to have this question on why does one set of plans come and why don't we progress on the other? So we've been asking for a while, the town council more generally, for a set of plans from DPW, not, not for the finished set of plans, but what's the plan? Um, so I think we can push harder on that because it goes with which roads are going to be repaired next. Um, yeah. it's, it's a similar it issue. So, so Elder, I'm just going to ask you because I have it as four four fifty nine. Um, so, right. five seconds to tell you 
that the traffic here in North Amherst, even at 10 in the morning, 1030, is backed up on both 116 and Sunderland Road and waiting to get through that light. And I've never seen traffic like that before COVID. So there's more people using that intersection. You can check the data on the lights, but that's a high priority to get that fixed before you build sidewalks. Thank you. I think there's probably no one in this room that would disagree <laughs> disagree with that intersection. That's been hanging on for years and years and years and years, and that doesn't happen. So I'm. I think it, for us, at least my. I've loved this meeting, <laughs> and I hope people liked being brought into the room. Um, and we're yes. going to. I'm going to. You're going to need to mute Hilda. So. Michelle and I can say goodbye to everybody. Um, and Michelle, I just want to turn it over to you. This was, Michelle was the inspiration. Let's get early. Let's get out in January. Um, and, and, and she and I are making a commitment to do this as often as people keep coming, I guess, um, you know, rather than, uh, and we have a, a good list of ideas right now. So Michelle, I'm just going to open it to you to close actually. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you everyone for being here. This was a really rich conversation and so great to see everybody's uh, faces and hear voices and, and just be together. Um, so yes, we will continue these meetings. I have a long list here um, of suggestions for future meetings. And so thank you. Thank you all for being here. And please do reach out to us by, by email or phone or um, yeah either of those ways, since we're not really getting together in person right now. Um, and hopefully in the spring, we'll be able to do that is to get together in person. So thank you. So I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, and uh, we will be back in touch with you with possible future dates. Please send us any thoughts on a Sunday afternoon versus a Tuesday or Wednesday, just uh, you don't care or you have preference, whatever. That would, it would be useful to know. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I'm gonna end the meeting and then I think. Stop, we have to stop recording, right? Yeah, then we have to stop the recording, right? Bye everyone. <laughs>